Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Good morning to you all. I'd like to thank the School of Public Health for inviting me to this uh, ceremony. I'm always glad to come. Bonnie, congratulations on a very well done presentation. I'm sure you're proud of yourself. Uh, yeah, I was. I took time to read your book. It was uh, a lot of work. I was very impressed by the volume, but also by the finesse and detail that you put into the analysis. Uh, I know that you had a short time to present, so you must have left out a lot of details uh, for the purposes of clarity. So um, I will try and raise some of those details that you may have left out for a further understanding of the audience. Um, so let's start from the beginning. So you chose this topic of alcohol and HIV, and I think you rightly superimposed the two graphs, the brother maps, the HIV prevalence and the alcohol prevalence. And clearly you can see that the superimposition is perfect for you to explore this as a problem. Uh, but I wanted to know further from you uh, a personal inspiration to choose this as a subject. I know you're a clinician. Why this subject? Um, thank you very much. Um, why this subject? Uh, uh, my interest in, in, in this topic arose from uh, when I did part of my master's thesis. I was looking at the uh, evolution of, uh, of uh, engagement in sexual risk behaviors in subjects who are receiving care still within the IDI over a three-year period. It was a, a very basic paper. But during that, during that uh, work, I noticed that uh, the subjects who reported in, uh, high risk behaviors uh, in the clinician's notes during my, my work, there was uh, that back-to-back -back information about alcohol use. But concurrently, there was no structure the way in which alcohol was assessed in this population. Yet there is enough evidence to show the interaction between alcohol and HIV infection, both for transmission and its adverse effects on people who are infected. So, the fact that the absence of that data, in, uh, I ended up reading more about it. But I, I realized that still there was less work that was being done in that area. Of course, as we transition along, this uh, has improved. But I say, in this population, I must come back and say, what, uh, what is the influence of alcohol on this behavior? I had done digital behaviors, but there was no alcohol information. So that's I thought with the doctoral work, it would be good to build that in a closely, after the same population. So you conclude that uh, alcohol consumption is high. Yes. And I, in your discussion, you suggest that it may actually be higher, which I, is true, I believe, because uh, J.P. Han, who you cited, uh, did some work in Barara and shows that using pen, uh, the biomarkers, which is the most sensitive way, showed that uh, among people who had said no, we didn't drink alcohol, they were actually testing positive on pain. So clearly, your prevalence of alcohol consumption is under. Uh, but when you say hi, uh, you didn't quite tell us. Is it only HIV positive people that drink alcohol? No, the whole population drinks alcohol. Uh, from the, one of the large population studies, the genesis, our study puts the prevalence of alcohol use in the general population at 47 percent, and uh, and uh, I want us to appreciate that either I was very converted or I, my thinking is not as great. In that I we 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 are looking at persons who come at least monthly to the clinic. They receive counseling to some degree, although it's not well structured and some of the effects of alcohol have been measured somewhere along the way, including in educational talks. So we would expect that to find way lower, uh, report, uh, way lower alcohol use than what we found. So that's why I think the, 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 
the values we found are still high and uh, looking at the, the, the scenario in which the, uh, the population in which the study was undertaken. I don't know whether that makes sense. Yeah, you do. Uh, so the next question then is uh, from the genesis data that you just cited. Who do you think is more likely to have a high prevalence of alcohol consumption in the general population or the HIV clinic? Um, the general population, of course, would, would have more. But looking at one, the interaction between this work from Rakai, Zabroska, and colleagues, and uh, uh, work from elsewhere in Uganda and other settings, so that people who get HIV, the, the, the proportion of people who, the incidence of HIV is high among people who take alcohol. And so, if we face that higher, I don't, I, I would think that still in the, the people who are in care, the, the, the proportion will still be high. But when we look at uh, the, some of the reasons that have been documented about alcohol use, for example, depression and uh, uh, these are, are, are very common in the people who are in this clinic and so with such with that those additional risks I would, I would not think the prevalence would be very different. But my based on my biased view as a clinician that it should be lower for the, for people because I understand for people who are who are infected and I care probably because of my biased view of the effects of alcohol. I don't know whether I answered the question. Yes, uh, you keep creating a new question. Uh, so the, the next question will be, uh, do we know the proportion of HIV positive patients that initiate alcohol consumption on discovery that they're HIV positive, uh, as opposed to those who were already drinking? It may have a bearing on the intervention that she talked about, which is another question I have. I do not have the proportions of harm but work done by, by Judy Hahn and uh, one of the authors is, is one of the examiners here, showed that people who are undergone HIV counseling and testing, when they return to, to receive their results and, and over time they appear to report a reduction in alcohol use. But still, additional work done in Barara have showed that as people who stayed longer in care, they tended to report reduction in alcohol use. But this longer, they followed people who had started ART. As in the longer they want ART, the, 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 likely, the more likely they want to reduce the alcohol use. And this was attributed to probably the, the, the strong free ART cancer and the prohibition of alcohol use were with ART. Okay. Uh, yeah, I think that's reasonable to understand. I, I think you are right. I think there's more data that needs to be collected. Uh, the next question is a more global question also uh, in relation to the study that, that you've done. You, you did two processional studies, a cohort study and a randomized trial. Um, I was trying to weave my head around all these four studies, uh, particularly regarding the study populations. I would be interested to know how these four uh, study populations are linked. Are they subsets of each other? Were some of the people in the trial part of the cross-sectional study that you did at the beginning? Uh, you see the point. I was a little lost as to whether these were all independent of each other. Yes, thank you very much. Uh, uh, the cross-section, the, the number, the, the first cross-sectional study that was described in alcohol use was a separate population of 725 subjects. The, the, the next, the randomized trial of 1,566 subjects was also a separate population. Uh, the, third, the, the third one, which was a randomized trial, we enrolled subjects separately and provided them with an intervention. Uh, so we realized that I made them separately that if we had provided an intervention, then I would be I would be interested in adjusting for the intervention in the 
objective towards CD4 problem over time, so you can reduce the alcohol use so better, uh, classify them in the exposure of hazardous or non hazardous. So the fourth one, which was looking at uh, the stages of change readiness tool, we used the baseline assessment for all these subjects. So uh, because it was a cross-sectional study. So the fourth, uh, the fourth uh, study incorporates data from all the three group, from all the, the three studies, provided the subjects fulfilled the entry criteria of, uh, of uh, half of score and three or more on the audit, and they had uh, data on this on the stages of change the tool field. Okay, so that's helpful, I think, uh, maybe for, if there's time, I think it might be helpful to create a diagram that uh, would show the marriage between all these uh, study groups. Uh, then the other point is about the study objectives. I think your study objectives are very clear, very well written, but I noticed the book that I received uh, is a little dated. I think you have changed some of the objectives, so maybe I shouldn't delve too much on that. Uh, okay, so the next point I have is um, on the MI, so motivational intervention. I think it's fairly new in South Southern Africa. Did you have any prior pilot test to show the visibility? Uh, before you actually did a randomized trial? Uh, we did not have a pilot test, uh, but uh, we did enough, uh, oh, precisely we did not have a pilot test, but we did, uh, uh, we, we tried to do enough, uh, enough work prior to incorporating most of the components and uh, also consulted psychologists and social scientists prior on, on what we think would be an appropriate intervention package. But I, 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 I think your point already is that the pilot would have been. Yeah, and the reason I ask that is the question of clinical echoes. You know, for any trial, you need to have that uncertainty. How much uncertainty uh, did your team have? I see you incorporated psychologists and social scientists. Uh, I, I, in my understanding, he, we, we had a population that is using alcohol, and the control arm was the standard dose intervention counseling. But it was still recorded high alcohol use. That is from the population side. From the from the trial side of Epicoid, we. Based on on on, on, on uh, our uh, 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 our reading, uh, I think uh, different. There is no currently there is no standard intervention that is advocated for for people living with HIV, especially in Sub-Saharan Africa. The, the different trials that have others have actually used the video doctor uh, on the uh, education leaflet and and have been tested in different settings. And so we thought that early intervention, there is clearly a need, but precisely on the equipoise of this tool, we, we, we chose MI compared to the others, because there is equipoise with all other possible interventions, but we chose MI based on our understanding of its rapidity of of what of of, of, of administration and the fact that there is work that was done so that it be even actually by paraprofessionals, uh, which if our intervention was effective would scale, scale up because we know HIV has been uh, taken to a lower part that's not necessarily provided by medical doctors. So precisely there was equipoise with very many but we chose one because of our we were looking at if it was effective, this is how advantage it would be. Okay, I think that's fair. Uh, of course, borrowing a lead from uh, the, West, the Western world where you know, numerous studies on their mind, motivation intervention, interventions have been done. Okay, the next question is again on the design of your studies, the cohort study. 
as you know, in a classical world, you have the exposure and the outcome. And ideally, the exposure precedes the outcome so that you have the temporality. Now, there's a little bit of a trick for you. If you put up the chart that showed the cover design, I think you see what I'm talking about. Uh, specifically here, you termed baseline. And baseline, you were referring to when you started measurements. And I believe baseline also refers to when the exposure starts. Yes. Correct. Yes. Yes, that's, that it has to be a yes, or it's not a god. <laughs> no, uh, no, I was hearing. <laughs> yes, it has to be a yes because then it's not a god. So if you say at baseline, uh, those were the drinking levels, the three, uh, the god, it's not the god, is it? It is the god. Okay. So you have the three groups, uh, based on drinking. Yes. Now. When does the exposure start? I, is this, in other words, is your T0 a true baseline? It is not. Our plan was actually to do this trial in people who are starting ART. That either we have a, a, a nearer that we we'll be looking at alcohol, CD4, in ART only. But at the, at the time of study implementation, of course, you know there are these works and when of ART supply and also the clinic, uh, clinic uh, in the clinical administration, there was a process in which ART was being initiated to people who are willing to go to other settings. So our initial classical cohort that we wanted among only those on ART was not possible. So now, when does the export start? That is the limitation, but I am looking at some subjects alcohol use within the past six months and seeing because the subjects have CD4 taken subsequently. So they could have taken the heavier along the way, but I classified them today. There are other issues that would affect their CD4 along the way, with some of which I try to adjust for, but I, I, I get uh, your, your, your criticism of, of, of that study design, but we are left with no choice based on other circumstances that occur in our study set. Okay, well you, you just touched on the second question. Uh, so the second question is, is exposure constant? But does it change over time? If I were classified as audit 8 and above, will I stay there? Or will I have lapses of abstinence, in which case I'm not exposed? And then I move back. Or even for audit 0, maybe some of these people initiate drinking. Uh, did you capture uh, measurements of exposure? Uh, renew the measurement of exposure or allow uh, exposure to be a time bearing coverage? Precisely no, and actually the reviewers of the paper, that was one of their concerns in that would have been better if we allowed the, the exposure to cover over time. And of course, naturally, even based on income and a lot of other things, alcohol use keeps changing. Uh, but, uh, we we looked at what alcohol was at this time and and, and, and see whether it did, at this time to take into taking into account your CD4, your duration of HIV, your gender, your everything, whether it has an effect on this. But I I take that very rightly that we need a problem. It would have been better if we we allowed more. Uh, the exposure to time. Yeah, yeah, I think you hit the nail on the head. I think this is a very complex causal uh, question. And maybe I answer the next question that I was going to ask you. Uh, how best could we have addressed this? Because you have a lot of other compounders that you couldn't possibly address in the linear mix models that you use. 
And so I was wondering, now that you know what you know, uh, what would you have done to your results in the final analysis show no difference? And clearly, you must be frustrated by that uh, because some studies and many other people previously showed that indeed, and from the biology that you presented, there is a causal link. So what should we or could we have done to better design uh, this study? Um, uh, what comes into my mind is what you have been discussing with one, of, of, of one, of one colleague in that we're looking at subjects who have just uh, tested of HIV and are entering care. And, and that is the earliest we could know about the HIV status, the, the first time it was tested. And this would provide a near to universally acceptable uh, beginning of, of, of exposure. But collect their exposure data for at least the last one year and still ascertain the exposure with, uh, with uh, an objective test, for example, with PET. At least that to give you alcohol use within the heavy alcohol use within the vicinity of us. And so this would give a, 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 a better time zero. And the other time zero which we had wanted was there, but now with the it, it would appear to be unethical to use the one I suggested about therapy because now the national I don't know whether they've been adopted, but it was launched, test and treat. So which means testing still becomes the best time zero in which we could evaluate such a study. And we were discussing or using the about the possibility of this in such trial or however we haven't done much. I don't know whether that answers some of the uh, well, I had a more radical proposition for you. Since you're interested in uh, randomized trials, I was going to propose that you conduct a randomized trial uh, in which you expose teetotalers who are starting ART to steady teetotalers, to start drinking alcohol to a level of 47, and to uh, a more extreme level. <laughs> Which the logic this committee approves that, <laughs> but but, they, but you could manipulate data to simulate a randomized trial using observational data. Yes. Yes. And you have the data. Yes. Um. Yes. Uh, I think the procedures. Uh, could be done using causal inflex methodology. It's really taking observational data and uh, transforming it to look like a randomized trial. Uh, and I'm sure that you might consider doing that uh, in the future since you have the data. I think it might uh, explain the complex exposure variables that you have and also the several confounders because, you know, adherence is the other. People drink alcohol, then they lapse in taking their medicines, and then they lapse back, and so it becomes a very complex question. Okay, um, the next question is on the definition of risky sex. You, in one of the uh, definitions, say that risky sex was two or more sexual partners. I think that's on page 30 or 31, page 30 and 31. Uh, reporting sexual intercourse with two or more sexual partners, regardless of their HIV serial status, is considered risky sex. So uh, I, I disagreed a little bit. What if this is a polygamous union, or a stable union, would you still call that risky sex? No, it, 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 it wouldn't be the sex in, in, in that case. Or if these two partners reported using condoms, this would still not be risky sex. I, I think that was an oversight. So is it possible that you may have misclassified some people as risky when they are not? Yes. OK, 
Okay. Um, the, the next question again is on the definitions. So, uh, sexual behavior was collected over six months, preceding six months. This is a cross sectional study, but you actually are collecting data over the preceding six months. Alcohol was collected over the preceding six months also. Is that correct? Yes. Um, but one measure of alcohol was collected over one month. Yes. CFLB. Yes. So that measure actually doesn't overlap sufficiently with the sexual behavior duration. Yes. Is that not a problem then? That you will be relating to factors that don't uh, overlap in terms of time frame? I, the yes and no. And no because our exposure of interest in this case was still the alcohol assessed by college and all the questions of college were structured to us within the past six months. Uh, that is the no. We added the, this 30 day, each day inquiry, each day inquiry, try and help the subject to remember what they are all use because uh, we, there was data to suggest that in trying to help elicit this memory cues subject more likely to give you details about the alcohol use. Also of course the uh, additional work we anticipated was to look at the uh, day variation, whether weekend or weekday consumption. And, but that, that was a part of, of this presentation but I think it did not necessarily have an effect because the exposure I, I analyzed was the audit, but I believe using the timeline for my approach could have helped me in subjects answering the audit in the more clear to what really happened. Oh, yes. That's it. So TFLB wasn't really used in the analysis. I, I look at it just to describe our values. I, I, I mentioned it. I, I okay. Uh, okay. The next question is on, again, methodology, data analysis approach. So, um, you, in very uh, detailed, uh, describe model building, how you enter all these variables. Um, and I just wanted to take you back to model building 101. There are two reasons why people build models. Yes. One is to adjust for compounding. Yes. The other reason is to build a predictive model where you actually want to see how well a set of factors predicts an outcome. For instance, alcohol in this case, you, want, you might want to know as a clinician, if I walk into a clinic on a given day, uh, would I support a patient who is more likely to abuse alcohol without even asking? So that's a predictive model. So in your analysis, which of the two are you uh, doing? Were you adjusting for compounding or you were trying to build a predictive model? I, in the analysis, I was adjusting for compounding strictly. But like you stated, I, I envisage as a clinician having some very simple tools to uh, give some cues of which the subject could be uh, misusing alcohol. So that was saying it was at the back of my mind, but the analysis was for uh, adjusting for compound. Okay, uh, I'm happy to say that because I think that's what the aims uh, insinuate. But then I was very surprised uh, that you were using statistical tests uh, to determine what variables are kept in the model. Is there a statistical test for compounding? Conceptually. No. Practice very slight uh, controversial variation in that. 
you could be uh, others will call it fishing, but you could be demonstrating an undetected uh, effect that could occur. So there is no uh, black and white answer that that you should I shouldn't use it to 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 remove or add variables into the model. I think the answer is no, there's no statistical test for compounding. So I was a little disturbed that um, you leaned a little bit against p values in making decisions. You're using so and so's criterion, which I, I thought was um, a little bit of a digression. I don't know what you think. So, in, in a sense, you were torn between whether you're building a predictive model or whether you're actually adjusting for compounding. Yes, that is true, but the p values were used for the Yeah, you, you, yes. Thank you. I think you've answered that question. So yeah, I think you're in the gray zone with a little bit of uncharted waters, and uh, that may become a problem. All right, uh, I wanted to take you still in the analysis. I think I like the way you wrote the book. You were really detailed. Anybody who didn't do the analysis would take your plan and actually do the analysis. It's good to be transparent in this way. I, I think in one section you said, oh, we initially thought we were going to use logistic regression, but when we looked at the the outcomes, it was very uh, prevalent, higher than expected, so we switched. So it's nice to be transparent, uh, but sometimes transparency can kill you. Uh, which is the next question I have for you. You initially uh, used the log binomial, and then things didn't converge, then you used the modified Poisson. So in the final analysis, did you use both, or did you choose one? Because if you use both, then it's a bit confusing as to uh, whether we should interpret the results on the same level. Um, because some models did not converge, you would end up using a modified Poisson. But I, 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 I see some, that means I, I made some papers, I don't know, but because for all that where well, we use the modified person, the models provide so we end up changing the initial in variable data to use the modified person. So the uh, analysis was uniformized to match the lack of convergence. Okay, that's good to know. Uh, all right, uh, then again, still in the analysis, this is now um, with uh, the randomized trial. You, you, obviously, the outcome was mean audit. Score, maybe on its C scores, and you conducted T tests. I think the results were not presented, unfortunately, yes. uh, which is a tragedy because it would have been nice to see uh, the results of the T test between and between groups and also within a group between the time intervals. Uh, but I think you are clever, maybe, not to present. Oh, you want to present? No. <laughs> Because um, uh, the reason why I'm saying you are clear or not present is that there might be a problem with the tests. Because I don't know how many T tests you did, but I think you may have entered the world of false discovery. Uh, if you are doing tests that generate 12 P values and are essentially testing the same hypothesis, the chances that you find one p value that is significant by chance is increased. Yes. So, uh, do you want to show us the results now? I, I agree with you and I flash the results, but since you alluded to that I'm having any question, I, I show them, but I insist on the on the primary analysis in that, uh, which was the linear mixed effects model. But I guess this is what those p values in there, for example, three months, what we see, these are many comparisons that were, were I, I should have adjusted for, 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 
for them, I think that's what you're... Yeah, I guess, I guess you actually don't have to adjust for them because I think the majority are actually not significant. Only one of them is uh, here. Uh, uh, and maybe I can finish this graph because I was going to ask you to put it up. This is nice. I didn't see it in the book. I was relieved when I saw it because I was going to ask for it. Um, so we see a decline and then they flatten. Yes. What does this mean? They flatten. The results flatten. I think it means the intervention uh, could have worked for the first three months and then the subjects developed a, a laissez fire attitude subsequently. That is what I am thinking in that the information probably needed to, to be, uh, the council needs to be repeated before we reach the months probably when I can say that. Repeated, I say that these lines can continue reducing. But also, uh, yeah, that's it. So your intervention was a single shot? Yes. And you hypothesized that it was going to take effect after six months. After six months. Yes, with a view of scalability and the availability of staff in this setting. Because it's a randomized trial, it's done in the ideal world. You know, you have all the resources. You're supposed to do the ideal in a randomized trial. Yes, it's not. Yeah. I'm supposed to do the ideal. Yes. But I was looking at. literature that appears to suggest that some, some interventions could be effective uh, provided once within. So maybe we should have a third arm that gets the intervention at a more um, frequent intervals to see whether the frequency, repeated exposures would have uh, a more lasting effect. That's his part. That's the yeah. Okay. Then how do we explain this? I'm sure the women who are bringing up will be very happy to know this, that the intervention works for them. But why? Gender is modifying the effect of the intervention on all these things. Yes. Why? I... I have been reading a lot around this but I have not uh, come up with a, a very plausible idea why this occurred. There is a suggestion that the, the woman's drinking or the, the, the female, the drinking among females is not necessary, may not necessarily be by and of themselves. And there is one to suggest that most of the women who drink tend to drink in company of, of, of male participants. So I, I try, I was trying, the, the, the truth is I don't have an answer. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I think you're right. I think like many interactions, you may not be able to explain them. Um, but maybe if we get back to your original question, which is the clinical equipoise, yes. you know, and understanding the type of change. I think you may have some answers built in there. I, I can't say I have it, I'm just speculating. Okay, uh, I was quite impressed, uh, and I think you flashed the slide for five seconds and the average uh, person who was looking didn't see. Uh, you did some elegant work to fix the missing data. I was fairly impressed by that. Um, then I asked the question though, why? Um, how much missing did you have? So for, for the people who maybe were not familiar, uh, he, he did a very elegant process to uh, fix the missing data problem by using a simulation procedure called Monte Carlo in which he generated 20 data sets that were complete using one data set that was incomplete. Uh, and so then he analyzed the 20 data sets and actually generated summary coefficients, and those are the ones that he reports. 
So it's very, fairly elegant. I was very impressed. But uh, after reading that, I asked myself, okay, this is a good tool, but did we deserve this? Was this a sledgehammer for applied? Uh, so how much limit, how much missing uh, was there? And specifically which variables, because I didn't see in the book which variables were missing. This is a randomized trial. I thought you know if you had sufficient time to measure. You, you are right. Uh, missing data, if I recall properly, was about 9%. But, I, to be honest, because I did not find an effect, I was trying to say, for this 9% be contributing to this no effect, that's why I did that. And because I, I, I took about a month to do that, I thought, if I don't present it, it will be unfair to the math I put in because I was trying to look for an effect. <laughs> yes, so you did look hard and the results are on page 73. I think there was a table that you presented earlier. If you put it up to see, uh, in which you present data from the multiple imputation using Monte Carlo and uh, using the complete and right. Yes. Yes. Was it worth it? But you are a PhD student, so you have to do it. Um, <clears throat> when, when we look at the, the the mean, the mean parameter estimates, we see it's changing from minus 0 0.07 to 0 0.1. So, I... Yes, so your, your p-value? Your p-values are all not significant. The confidence intervals overlap. There's a slight difference in the mean when it change. So we can say that imputation doesn't really make a difference. So you couldn't say that the lack of uh, no. missing data? No. Okay. Uh, I'm about to conclude. Um, I will talk about the least celebrated objective from your presentation. The least yes. celebrated. I'm sure you know what it is. Yes. Um, okay. It's not what, oh, it's working now. Okay, um, factor analysis. Again, I respect that you tackled um, a tool and applied methodologies that are quite uncommon. Um, but you can hear me. I can speak, actually, I'm a teacher. In my normal life, I can speak loud. But, uh, but, oh, okay, maybe it's bad for you once he tells us. Oh, it's a bad thing. Okay. Yeah. 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 okay, so the factor analysis. Um, you presented this data, but you, in the end, I kept asking myself, how do we translate this? For a layman, can you translate um, that objective into English? How do we benefit from the factor analysis? Thank you very much. Um, just to give you a background, at the initial work that would have been objective for rotated around uh, validity of audit vis-a-vis -vis, uh, <coughs> objective and objective biomarker that I would have chosen if I had done them. Having failed that, I, I thought I would still do a paper that tries to adapt some uh, methodology or adapt a tool causing it. It was 
sets across the receiving and adapting a tool using a different setting to this setting. So this object, so that is the the reasoning for that objective. But what the objective is trying to tell us is that subjects who are using alcohol and qualified to, to, to be called to be having alcohol misuse, uh, they are their state, their readiness to change their alcohol use could be measured using a tool from a different setting and it's possible that, that the way that tool works here is slightly different from the original inventors. So that's all we know now. Because in the development of a tool now it would need to confirm whether in a similar population whether that, that's the data we could get. In very few words, that, that objective was trying to help us use a tool developed in a different area to see how it would work in this setting. But in the preliminary stages of that tool, which is really preliminary. Yes, uh, I think you do. Uh, I think there are the five details which I want to raise in the interest of time. So Mr. Chairman, thank you very much. Bonnie, thank you.